Hello and welcome to section 6.5 of the OpenStax Chemistry text. Today we'll be discussing the periodic variations and elemental properties. So, in this section we've, we've covered a lot of, in this chapter so far we've covered a lot of material. We gave an introduction into the difference between classical theory and quantum theory, the experiments and the observations that led up to quantum theory, the knowledge, the information that came out of quantum theory in predicting the structure of the periodic table, and therefore those valence electrons and their abilities of the reacting and why things happen in a periodic fashion. Now we're going to be talking about the variations in these properties. So what are the properties of the elements and can we explain them? Well, of course we can explain them. How do we explain them? What, what, what's going on here? So, elements in the groups, let me zoom in just a little bit here. Okay, elements in the groups, those are the columns, right? These have similar chemical behaviors, right? We've got like the lanthanides, and I mean, we've got the, uh, gosh, no, lanthanides are in a, in a row. We're talking about the uh, alkali metals, the alkali earth metals, the noble gases, right, the halides. Okay, these occur because the members of the group have the same number of distribution of electrons in their valence shell, in those that outer shells there, right? However, there are also other patterns of properties on the periodic table. For example, as we go down a group, the metallic character of the, of the atoms increases. So, as for an example, in group 16, we have oxygen at the very top, and that's a gas. As we go down, we have sulfur, selenium, Terillium, and at the very bottom we have polonium, and polonium is a silver gray solid. So we're going from a odorless gas at the top down into semi metal, and then down from there into a, a solid gray that conducts electricity. So we're increasing these metallic properties. Now, as we go across from left to right, we're adding protons to that nucleus and an electron to the valence shell. However, if we think about, oh, so yeah, to the valence shell with each element. As we go down the elements in a group, the number of electrons in the valence shell remain constant, but the principal quantum number increases. Just as we have seen, hydrogen has 1s1, the electron, the valence electron for lithium is the 2s1, for sodium it's the 3s1. So that three, that, that quantum number, that first number there, the principal quantum number is increasing by one each time. Knowing the, uh, knowing the electronic structure for the elements and understanding what, what that electronic structure means allows us to examine some of the properties that govern the chemical behavior and the, uh, how these properties vary as we go across and go down the periodic table. So the properties that we're looking at is going to be the size, the radius of the atoms and ions, ionization energy, so removing electrons, and electron affinities, so the affinity for the electrons. So for variations in the covalent radius, what are we talking about here? Variation, the differences, and covalent, so we're talking about things that are in a covalent, um, covalent bond, and radius, what we're talking about from the center to the outside of a, of a sphere, right? There are lots of different ways to talk about the size, so we're going to use this covalent radius, and we're defining that as one half the distance between the nuclei of two identical atoms when they are joined by a covalent bond, meaning that they should be, if a bond is equal sharing and the two things are the same thing, they should be sharing them definitely equally, which means half of the radius, half the distance between the two nuclei is going to be the radius from one nuclei to the, to the outside and then from the outside of that to the other nuclei. So, we know that as we scan down a group, the principal quantum number increases and that this principal quantum number has to deal with the size, the location of that energy, and that as we go down the periodic table, the principal number increases, the electrons are spending more time in the outer reaches of that, of that element. And so, 
the electrons are being added to a space that is increasingly distant from the nucleus. Therefore, as we go down a row, I mean, go down a column, the size of the atom, and therefore its covalent radius, is going to increase. So, as an example, we see the halogens, and we see that the radius is increasing as we go down, and this corresponds to an increase in that nuclear charge. And here's an example, right? We see we have these all diatomic molecules, they've got a covalent bond, and we take half the distance between the two, and that will give us the covalent radii, radius. Okay. So, looking at this, we can see as we go down a, a certain column, the radius is increasing. As we go down the column, the radius is increasing. So, the general trend is that the radii increase down a group and decrease across a period. So they're getting smaller as we go across the period. We see that here. See, this is sort of big and then it's getting smaller as we go across. A little bit of uh, variation that comes into play here. We'll see that um, in this picture. Right? We're looking at the radius size on the y-axis, on the x-axis, we're talking about the atomic number. And we see, going from hydrogen to helium, it's gotten smaller. Then it goes really big for lithium. And as we go across from lithium to neon, that size gets smaller. Now there is a little bit of an uptick right here at the end. As we go from neon to sodium, it gets really big. We've got to that next principal quantum number, and then it starts decreasing as we go across the row. So the general trend here, as you go down a column, it's going to increase in size. As you go across a single row, you're decreasing in size. Now why is that? Why is it that it decreases in size going across? This can be explained with the concept of the affected nuclear charge. This is the pull that is exerted on a specific electron by the nucleus. Now, all of those electrons that we're adding are being added to the valence shell. The valence shell is talking about the size of the shell from the nucleus, right? The, the principal quantum number is talking about the size of the shell from the nucleus. As we're adding those electrons in, they're being added to that same shell. However, the nucleus is increasing in a positive charge. So if you're added to the same space, what's happening is that there's going to be less shielding effect occurring, that the, the, the nuclear charge is going to be stronger and it's going to be it's not going to be less shielding, sorry, the nuclear charge is going to be stronger and it's going to pull those electrons in tighter. Right? So, taking into account the electron-electron repulsions, there's only, for hydrogen, there's only one electron, so the nuclear charge is Z. The effective nuclear charge is Z effective. This is the, the filling of that. Right? However, for all other atoms, the inner electrons somewhat shield that outer electron from the, um, from the charge of the nucleus. Okay. So the V effective is going to be the charge of the nucleus minus the shielding. Okay. The shielding, however, is determined by the probability of another electron being between that electron of interest and the nucleus. So an electron being in here that is effectively repulsing, it's, it's shielding that this electron from the charge of the nucleus. So each time we move from one element to the next across a row, across a period, the, uh, the charge of the nucleus is going to increase by, by one. But the shielding is only going to increase slightly. Because remember, we're adding those to the same shell. 
because valence electrons in the same valence shell do not block the nuclear attraction experienced by each other as efficiently. The ones on the inner shell, well, those are still going to be there, but we're adding these extra, like these other electrons as we go across the road, we're adding these other electrons to that outer shell and they're not going to be repulsing each other as much as the effective charge of the nucleus is going to be attracting them. And so we're going to have a shrinking of that radii as we go across. We're going to have a stronger pull experienced by electrons on the right side of the periodic table. And this draws them closer to the nucleus, meaning you have a smaller radii. So as we expect, the outermost of those valence electrons are the easiest to remove. Why? Well, because they have the highest energy. So we only have to put in a little bit more energy in order to actually get them pop to pop up. They have the most shielding and they are the farthest from the nucleus. So as a general rule, when the elements are going to form cations, they do so by loss of the ns or the np electrons that were added last. Like we had seen in the end of the last section, we were discussing how to make an anion, how to make an anion and a cation. Well, to make a cation, you're going to remove from the main group elements the last added election, electron, and for the transition elements, they're going to be coming from instead of the n minus one d, which were the last added, they actually come from the n s. So the highest s electrons come out. So for the three d, three d row we would actually remove the 4s electrons before we'd stop taking off the 3d. So, predicting the order of the increase in covalent radius for germanium, fluorine, bromine, krypton. Well, we've got uh, Huh. Fluorovium, not fluorine. I was, I was like, where is, I don't even see FL, I don't see fluorovium on the table. I'm not sure where that's located. I want it to be down on the bottom because that would make sense to me. But I don't have a lot of experience with the transition elements. Element 114 is what it says there, 114. Oh, ha. I don't see it because the periodic table that I'm looking at over on my wall is actually an older periodic table and they hadn't named that element yet. At that point it was still a un un uh, quartium or something, it was uh, 114, 114, so 114. Uh, okay, good, I'm not going completely crazy. So, germanium is on the right hand side and it's on the left side of bromine. So germanium is going to be bigger than bromine. Now, both, now it's also bromine and germanium are on the left, so let's look at the periodic table. Here we've got germanium and, and we know that as you go across it gets smaller, so this is going to be the smallest that's the next smallest, that's the next smallest, and the biggest is going to be FL, because that's lower down on the periodic table. It's got a much higher N, N value there. A much higher uh, principal quantum number. So, variation in ionic radii. Ionic radius is the measure used to describe the size of an ion. So now we're talking about size of cations and size of anions. This is a little bit easier to understand, I believe, because if you think about what's happening in a cation, you're removing an electron from the outer shell. What's that going to do? Well, you're removing that electron, that's going to shrink that a little bit. So the cation, a cation is going to be smaller than the respective neutral element. However, with an anion, you're adding electrons, so an anion is going to have a larger shell than a larger radius than its respective neutral atom. <clears throat> so, 
system. As electrons are removed from the outer valence shell, the remaining core electrons occupying smaller shells experience a greater charge from that nucleus, a greater Z effective charge, and they're drawn even closer, so it's going to shrink in size. Cations with larger charges are smaller than cations with smaller charges. So if you take off one electron, it shrinks. If you take off two electrons, it shrinks even more. Take off three electrons, it'll shrink even more. As seen with the anion, the opposite is true, right? As we add the electrons, we're adding those to the valence shell. This is resulting in a greater repulsion, a decrease in the effective charge. Everything's going to move out a little bit. Things get bigger. So they will have an increase in the, um, in the radius. And the more, the more electrons you put, uh, put in, the larger they're going to be. For example, sulfur that takes on the S2 minus charge. By adding those two electrons, it goes from a covalent radius of 104 to 170. Okay. Now, here's an important thing. Atoms, well, it's all important, right? Atoms and ions that have the same electron configuration are what are called Isoelectronic. Iso means same. Electronic means like the electronic configuration, right? So when we form like O2 minus, well, that gets us over to looking like neon. Well, it has the same electronic structure as neon at that point. N3 minus, well, in the um, nitrogen, if we look, N3 minus, well, adding one, two, three electrons gets us to the, the same as neon. O2 minus gets us to neon. F minus gets us to neon. Carbon 4 minus would get us to neon. Um, these things that are on the other side of it, sodium plus one, well, that's removing an electron. That gets us to neon. Magnesium removed two electrons, Mg2 plus, that gets us to the neon. So these will all have the same configuration, electronic configuration as neon. Of course, they've got a different number of protons, right? So they're still completely different than neon, but they have the same electronic configuration as neon. They're isoelectronic. They all have the same electronic structure. Okay. And therefore, the number of protons are going to determine the size. The greater the nuclear charge, the smaller the radius. Okay. So the greater the nuclear charge, the smaller the radius. And that still goes along with the ideas of, uh, if we work through it, from what we know about the radii of the nu neutral versus the radii of the I ionic. Variation in ionization energies. Definition. The amount of energy required to remove the most loosely bound electron from a gaseous atom to its ground state is called the first ionization energy. Okay. The first ionization energy for an element X is the energy required to form a cation with a plus one charge. So to remove that first electron is what's known as the ionization energy. And you're removing it from a neutral gaseous atom in its ground state. And that would be the first ionization. Now, if we go to take off a second electron, we would have what is known as the second ionization energy. The energy required to remove the third electron is the third ionization energy, and so forth. It always takes energy to remove electrons, right? We always have to add energy in to rip that electron away from the atom. Ionization process is therefore always endothermic, and the ionization energy values are always positive. 
we're always talking about the amount of energy it takes to remove that electron. For bigger atoms, the most loosely bound is located really far away, and so it takes less energy than for those electrons which are closer to the atom. So as the size increases, the ionization energy should decrease. Okay, so using this logic, what we've learned about radii, we would expect first ionization energies to decrease going down in group. We would expect it to be more difficult to remove an electron from hydrogen than lithium, than sodium, than potassium. And they would increase across a period. So it would take more energy to move, remove an electron from boron than from beryllium, or from oxygen than from nitrogen. Um, these things have been measured. They have been predicted, they've been measured, and they've been calculated. Within a period, the first ionization energy generally increases with Z. Down a group, the ionization energy value generally decreases with an in increase in Z. So across a period, it increases with increasing Z. Down a group, it generally decreases with increasing Z. Don't you like that word generally? Generally? What does that mean? means generally, for the most part, it's not always without exception, it's generally. This is a general rule. It's not steadfast, always true. They're all systematic deviations from this trend. For example, we can see that here in this graph of the ionization energy as we're increasing the atomic number, as we go across, yes, hydrogen, it's, it's harder to take it from helium than from hydrogen. It's a higher ionization energy. Then it drops way down, and it's more difficult to take it from beryllium than lithium, but it's easier to take it from boron by beryllium. And we see, then we get to nitrogen. It's more difficult to take it from nitrogen than from oxygen. So that goes against what we would have expected. But why could this be? Well, if we look at the trend long enough, we may find the pattern. This can be explained that within any one shell, the S electrons are lower in energy than the P electrons. So an S electron is harder to remove from an electron than a P electron in the same shell. So the electron removed during the ionization of beryllium is an ele S electron, whereas the electron removed during the ionization of boron is a P electron, so it's going to take less energy to remove the P electron than the S electron. So we see, what we see is a small deviation from the predicted trend each time a new subshell begins. And that's what we see. So we are given here a list of the ionization energies for some of the elements. With this, if, if you're working a problem that's talking about ionization energies, you should refer back to this. Remember the units here are kilojoules per mole. So we're talking about the amount of energy it takes to ionize one mole of that gaseous atom. There's a second type of deviation that we see. As the orbitals become more than one half filled, right? And so this explains that difference between nitrogen and oxygen. With nitrogen, we have three p electrons. So we have put one in each of those orbitals. With oxygen, we've put in, a, we've started to pair them up. Well, it's easier to remove it from the pair because there's some electron-electron repulsion going on there, right? There's by removing one electron from the uh, oxygen, we will eliminate that electron-electron repulsion of the spin-up and spin-down in the same, in being in the same orbital, and this will result in a half-filled orbital, which is energetically favorable, as we discussed with the, uh, the Ds being D5 is energetically favorable, more so, and so it will borrow from the S, right? This is a similar concept there. 
it's more energetically favorable to have it half filled and so that creates a little bit of a stability um, and we can see that here that it's a little bit let, it's a little bit more energetically favorable to remove it from oxygen, from the nitrogen, from sulfur than from phosphorus, from uh, selenium than from arsenic. Uh, other stuff gets it gets a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with the uh, transitions and such. Uh, there's just more electrons and more interactions going on. Now, for removing multiple electrons, for removing multiple electrons, we see that there are huge jumps when you're starting to go from one subshell to the next, or from one shell to the next. So for potassium, we take off the two electrons, and uh, we take off the first electron, that's not so bad. That second electron, huge jump in almost an order of magnitude. Um, for calcium, where it's got it's a two plus normally, right? It's easier to take off that first electron. That second electron comes off somewhat easy, but to remove that third electron, you're trying to get down into the noble gas configuration. That doesn't want to happen. It wants to maintain that filled shelf. And so it's a huge jump. So, predict the order of increasing energy for the following process. The first ionization energy for aluminum, the first for uh, trillium, I guess, I think that's it, what we're after. The second ionization for sodium, the third for aluminum. So, for ionization E1 for aluminum, we're removing it from a somewhat small atom up on the, close to the top. See a little bit of electron shorting, it's in that first P. Okay, so it would be easier um, to remove it from terillium, which is lower down, it's got that electron further out, so it's easier to remove it from terillium than from aluminum. Now if we're talking about the second ionization for sodium, well, for the first ionization energy, not so bad for the second ionization energy, which is clinging down into that core shell. And so that's, that gets much higher energy. For IE3, for aluminum, well, that's getting us down into that, uh, we're having to remove one, remove two, and remove three. So we know that that's going to be extremely um, energetically unfavorable but removing it from that core set is going to be more so for the sodium. So, we see that trillium, the biggest one, has the lowest ionization energy for the first, and then it would be, i.e., the first ionization for aluminum, the third for aluminum, and then trying to remove that one from the core electrons for sodium. Okay, here's the last one. We're talking about electron affinity. So, the electron affinity is the energy change for the process of adding an electron to a gaseous atom to form an anion. Remember that. We're taking an electron and adding it to a gaseous atom to form the electron. This is the electron affinity. Now, this isn't as simple as for the um, as for the the ionization energy, where we were always taking energy to remove an electron. This can be positive or could be negative, depending upon whether it's energetically favorable for an electron to be added or for electrons to be removed. Whether it wants to be that anion or whether it would rather be neutral or possibly a cation. So it can be either endothermic or exothermic, depending upon the element. For some elements, if it's going to be negative values, exothermic energy is being released as it accepts the electrons. However, for some, 
it actually requires energy for it to become negatively charged. So therefore, it's going to have a positive value. It's going to be endothermic. It becomes easier to add an electron across a series of atoms because the nuclear charge has increased. And as we see, if we go across on the left-hand side of the periodic table, we usually think those are going to be cations. They don't necessarily want an electron to be added. But as we increase that nuclear charge without really increasing the size too much, right? we're increasing the nuclear charge that's actually getting smaller because the shielding is less effective. And so we're decreasing the size. Well, those electrons that we're adding are going to fill a stronger pool by the nucleus. And so the EAs tend to become more negative. They tend to be more energetically favorable for that to occur, being exothermic. There are exceptions. They can be found in the elements of group 2, group 15, and group 18. And this can be based upon, this can be understood based on the electronic structure. Of course, for 18, these are completely filled. They don't want to add electrons. Right, so it's difficult to do that. For the group 2, it has a filled subshell. Right? We filled that S shell. And we'd have to put the incoming electron into a higher N level. And that's a little bit difficult. I mean, that, I mean we'll put, the, put the into the next subshell. So, and that, that energy is, activation energy is not as the trend would predict. And so it's going into a higher energy shell. So the energy it takes to put it in there is a little bit less. Now, for group 5A, they have the half-filled NP subshell, that's the nitrogen, the phosphorus that we were just referring to. And so actually, it, you know, it's, these are all based upon the initial relative stability of the electronic configuration. And since the half-filled shell, half shell is more electronically stable than a shell that's not half-filled, it's actually going to have, take more energy to add an extra electron. As we move down a group, we see that the second element in the group often has the greatest electron affinity. Why? Well, the reduction of the electron affinity of the first member can be attributed to the very small size, how strongly that um, nucleus is going to be pulling on that electron. However, for the next one down, um, the next one down, the size has increased, so it's attracted to the nucleus, but it also is filling the repulsion of those core electrons. And so that's, you, you get that change in the um, electron affinity. So for electron affinity, there's not really as great of a way to determine it, but if you look at the electronic structure, it'll provide you uh, if you look at the electronic structure and use the other properties, you can figure out and understand why the electron affinity values exist as they do. Right, so we see, see that in this table that, you know, for the most part, after you get from here down, it's going to, you know, be somewhat higher. This is, this is less than that one because this is really filling this up. Over on this side, you've got the more positive, except for like right here. These are negative. It doesn't want to, it, it, it's going to be, you know, releasing some energy. Here, this is really positive because you don't want to add to get, you know, you know you're having to add it to the 2P shell here. These, you know, so it's not quite as straightforward as some of those other trends. So the properties and knowing where to go to get this information is extremely important. These are central to understanding the reactivity. For example, because fluorine has an energetically favorable electron affinity and a large barrier to ionization, it is much easier to form fluorine anions than cations. It's easier to add 
an electron then to remove electrons. Properties of metals, including conductivity and malleability, depend on having electrons that can be removed easily. Thus, the metallic character can be explained by this property of, of as, we, as we go down. Right? Because the, it, in, uh, it increases as we go down, decreases as we go across, because of that trend of the atomic size as to how strongly those valences, outer electrons, are being pulled to the nucleus. Okay, so let's go through the summary of this. Electron, okay, so covalent radius mostly decreases as we go left to right, and it increases as we go top to bottom. For anions and cations, cations are going to be smaller than their neutral, and bigger anions are going to be bigger than the neutral. For ionization energy, um, this decreases going down a group, and for the most part, it increases going across a period because it's easier to remove an electron from the bigger ones and tougher from the smaller. Electron affinity is more favorable when the electrons are placed into lower energy orbitals closer to the nucleus. Therefore, electron affinity becomes increasingly negative as we move from left to right, and it decreases as we go down. But there are exceptions for both, i.e., for the, the ionization energy and for the electronic affinity. And there are exceptions, and these come about when dealing with completely filled or the half-filled subshells and also due to the sizes. That is the end of chapter seven. Wonderful, spectacular, here's the glossary. We've gone through this, I think we've got a big thing to, to keep in mind. Electron affinity is the energy required to add an electron to a gaseous atom to form an anion. Of ionization energy is the energy to remove an electron from a gaseous atom or ion. And this, this one can be positive or negative. This one is always a positive value. It always takes energy to remove an electron. All right, that's what I've got for you for this chapter. We're done. Let's move on to the next. See you then.